All right. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this installment of the Friday Colloquium hosted by Azim Premji University. Uh, my name is Manu Mathai, and I'm a member of the faculty here at the university, and I will be the moderator for this afternoon's session. Um, thank you for joining us for this timely and very relevant uh, discussion. Uh, the use of collective pronouns, I'm sure, as you're aware of, is quite common in unsustainable, in sustainability conversations. So when people are talking about the environment and things, there's a lot of use of our and we and so forth. So for example, our common future or the future we want. Now, both of these are actually very good examples that call into existence some kind of a universal collective, which is actually the theme that our speaker is going to spend time talking about today. Uh, but what is the nature of this collective? What is its identity? Uh, which identities reside within and which are excluded. So in her talk today, uh, this afternoon, our speaker will question and critique this widely used category. Her talk, as you know, is titled The Global and the Local, Rethinking the Collective in the Age of the Anthropocene. Anu Jales is Assistant Professor of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore. She is an environmental anthropologist working on the human-animal interface, migration, and climate change, all very timely topics, particularly in Bangladesh and India. She is the author of Forests of Tigers, People, Politics, and Environment in the Sundarbans, uh, published in 2010 by Routledge, and the co-author of The Bengal Diaspora, Rethinking Muslim Migration, also published by Routledge in 2015. Uh, before I hand over to uh, Professor Jalez, let me quickly just remind everyone of a couple of housekeeping uh, details. Our speaker will have 45 minutes uh, to make her comments, and then we'll open it up for Q&A, for which we will also have 45 minutes. And uh, to facilitate the question and answer session, um, I would encourage everybody to please uh, type your questions in the live chat box. And uh, we and the team that's assisting me uh, will bring the questions to Professor Jalais's attention. Okay. With that, uh, let me invite uh, Professor Jalais to the to take the floor, the virtual floor. Okay. Over to you, Anu. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mathai, for uh, your kind introduction. It's a great honor to have been invited, and I'm really happy uh, to talk about some of uh, the themes I'm interested in today. Uh, this is very new work, and uh, these are part of slides of a course I teach at NUS called Beasts, People, and Wild Environments, focusing on South Asia. And uh, basically, uh, around uh, this beast people wild environments around the human uh, non human interface you know i've been i've been thinking really around the the idea of collectives and how to make sense of it so i look forward to your comments and um, your suggestions at the end of uh, this talk so as i said i am not completely um, you know uh, um, this is this is very new so um, Please bear with me. Um, so the global and the local, rethinking the collective in the age of the Anthropocene. And uh, so the Anthropocene introduced a new universal collective, the human species seen as a group and acting as a global geophysical agent. And uh, people have been writing about this uh, so-called universal collective. Uh, but I feel that it has been looked at from a Western perspective and not really explored in relation to what a universal collective might mean from outside uh, the Euro-American uh, you know, zone. So I think that we need to rethink universal and for that we need to perhaps uh, look at uh, what, what we mean by um, non-humans. And so this is an attempt to do that. Okay, so this is what I was saying, you know, so we look at it from, you know, and so this binary between uh, humans and animals is a, a, you know, is one with which a lot of us have grown up with. It is for me a very Judeo-Christian one, one where, um, you know, culture is above nature, culture is out there to sort of um, control nature, uh, culture is out there to protect nature. Basically, we are the actors. We decide and, uh, you know, uh, animals, uh, the environment is um, something that is under 
our um, you know our, our our force right that's that's how we've been sensitized to this whole thing um, and so this is what I was telling you we live in this age called the Anthropocene that begins when human activities suddenly start to have a, a very significant impact on the climate we are gods okay we are changing the way in which the planet uh, is has evolved and um, so scientists are not very sure about when exactly they should put this date some say 1785 some say before that some say uh, really it was in the middle of the 20th century with um, you know um, yeah, uh, the use of of, uh, of nuclear in in a particular way so what I feel needs to be rethought, as I said, is this idea of the universal. And also because I feel that perhaps uh, a rethinking of the universal is what can help us um, really connect with people who don't necessarily see themselves as the you know, controllers or protectors of the environment. Uh, people who don't necessarily see the human at the top and uh, people who don't necessarily see a binary between the, the two. So, and I think that this is important, it is important to rethink this because really the majority world, as uh, a lot of us say, uh, is often at the receiving end of, um, you know, climate change. And climate change is, is, is one of, of the factors of social inequities, but it will soon become the most important factor of, uh, you know, really uh, who breathes um, pure air, who drinks uh, pure water, who uh, can eat unadulterated food, uh, who lives near, um, you know, parks and, and forests and all of that. So there is going to be, you know, as, as we see it, um, there is really, it is along the lines of, um, of, 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 you know, this, that uh, we are going to make a distinction, right, between those who have access to a better air versus those who don't. And you might be saying, okay, I live in this very big uh, <clears throat> city in Delhi, which uh, is highly polluted. But uh, if you are a, a middle class person, um, you know, um, and probably have, uh, and when I say middle class, it's really a euphemism to talk about the 10% uh, at the top. Um, but people who have cars, who have uh, air conditioned homes, who don't necessarily have to breathe this air all the time. So it's not as if I'm making a big distinction between you know those um, in, in, in the North versus those in the South. Uh, I mean, the global North and global South, but it is a way of sort of thinking within you know certain cities in the global North and in the global South, where do the distinctions lie? Uh, so this is uh, the kind of future a lot of scientists are predicting. Um, and so uh, how, how, you know, I'm, I'm, not, uh, uh, I'm not a scientist, I'm a social scientist. So how do I rethink people's futures, how people will will think about these things, okay? I can't really have much of an effect on the way in which things are going to change, but we can perhaps sort of try and um, open up uh, discussions about what we mean by, um, you know, by, by, by being humans existing in such a world. And so, we're facing a crisis of sustainability, and I know most of you at Azim Premji are, are working on this, where a large proportion of living beings will not be able to survive or will have very, very uh, you know, poor uh, living conditions, survive the combined effects of uh, climate change. And I think that, uh, you know, recently, for example, for me, a book that has been very important has been The Great Derangement by Amitav Ghosh, where he talks about the fact that we really need to reimagine, rethink um, the ways in which um, we, we do literature. And that has to do with stopping from seeing ourselves at the top, 
we need to reckon with the uncanny, with the strange, with the unfamiliar. It shouldn't be relegated to the sci-fi, um, you know, category anymore. It should really be incorporated within uh, within literature and I feel within the social sciences, you know. So how do we make sense of what is happening around us? Uh, something that we don't necessarily always um, fully comprehend, at least not at this point. So <clears throat> in in inequality is not inevitable, okay? And, and this is something that um, I, I really want to start off with, you know, if there are pe places like uh, the Nordic countries, like Sweden and um, Denmark, where um, you have parity between men and women as CEOs, you have uh, people uh, who are, you know, paying huge taxes if they are making a lot of money, and you don't have uh, too many poor people. Uh, in those countries. And you have, on the other hand, countries like uh, the USA, India, Bangladesh, where you have a huge uh, distinction between people. So this is not necessarily to do with, a, you know, this is not something we should we should take as a given. I think this is something that governments should really be um, forced to, to, to look at and to rethink, you know, why should, for example, today India go the US way instead of going the, you know, uh, uh, the Swedish way, let's say, or the German way, uh, where education and healthcare is free for everybody. So um, in a future, you know, a, a future uh, is a future based on capitalist lifestyles, consumption, carbon in inequality, war, uh, plastic dollars, exploitative business, the only future we can look forward to. And it is a future that I, I feel personally capitalism brings. Right? And, and so what has led us to this? Where do we look for solutions? How do we rethink, um, you know, this, this kind of... Um, complete segregation between people. And while I was um, thinking about these things, I also came across um, Prasenjit Dwara's book, which is, um, it, it's called The Crisis of Global Modernity. It came around the same time as uh, The Great Derangement, a year before The Great Derangement. And it was a book that made me think a lot because he says that faced with the unsustainable nature of global modernity, we need to uh, rethink uh, viable futures, perhaps by turning towards Asian social and co cultural cosmological traditions. Okay, he talks about the importance of dialogical transcendence. And he says that perhaps the fact that there isn't one overarching idea of a, a god, you know, uh, that perhaps um, Asian cultures are better suited to um, offer a greater understanding of um, what it means to be cohabiting with uh, nature, with the environment. And I think that 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 is quite an interesting concept, you know, the fact that uh, a, a sort of Judeo-Christian understanding of the world is one that is not helpful um, to have more, you know, more uh, equal relationships with nature. So he says, and, and so he says, you know, what led us to this? Two things, globalization, disenchantment, capitalism, all of that, okay? And so he says that we really need to, you know, he looks at Max Weber and says that uh, the, the world mastery of, by calculability and prediction was made possible by the process of disenchantment, one where uh, religion and irrational knowledge came to be replaced by science and technological knowledge. And this is partly what Amitabh Ghosh says in The Great Derangement. In a way, he says that uh, sometime, if I remember correctly, with Darwin, you know, with the middle of the 19th century, there is predictability. There is a way of believing that we, uh, you know, can now control nature. We can now. And so he says that a lot of the stories which previously used to have elements of mystery, elements of um, superstition, elements of uh, being enchanted, you had all kinds of uh, 
you know, animals represented, dragons and phoenixes. Uh, you suddenly had, with the 19th century, a certain impoverishment because literature became all about the couple or the family. And suddenly you couldn't talk about a dragon because people said that doesn't exist. We are now moderns. We have, you know, we don't believe in these um, superstitious, strange creatures. We don't believe in ghosts. We don't believe in, in, in all these, you know, disturbing non-humans. We control you know, heating in our house, we control uh, cooling through the AC, we control everything. So basically, in a way, you know, this fact that we have become gods has brought a certain disenchantment. Okay. And so he says that, you know, of course, this was made possible through a certain religious knowledge and practice, which he calls Protestantism, which, which is Protestantism. And uh, so Duara discusses Weber and says, you know, I, I, I don't disagree with his uh, idea that, um, you know, that perhaps this certain ethic, this certain thinking brought about the modern revolution. But he says that what has happened is that this modern revolution has resulted in a saturation point with regards to the conquest of nature by man. Okay. And so it's like we have reached a, a, a an impasse, a, you know, a, a roadblock. Um, so in this context, how do we rethink the environment and our relationship with nature? So wildlife conservation has entailed the displacement, uh, as we know, of forest dwelling people, marginalized group and caused impoverishment, social dislocation, loss of livelihoods, loss of cultural capital, okay, loss of language, loss of art, loss of, loss of tradition, especially in, in places uh, of, of the global south. Um, and you know, it has even even India's Forest Rights Act hasn't done much really for all the indigenous uh, communities that have been displaced uh, from forested areas all over the world. And I feel that the main problem is the lack of part of a participatory process, which decides who, how, where should people be relocated if they should be at all? How should they be compensated? Uh, most of the time, coercion is used, and uh, this really uh it, you know this this really brings to greater not just inequality but greater unsustainability because it means that a lot of the uh you know forest coverage is being um cut off look at brazil and brazil now is producing carbon instead of you know absorbing it um and and so by 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 enriching the few uh, we are not just impoverishing the majority, but we are actually killing off uh, the only planet that we have. Um, so the contradictions about the universal collective uh, for me comes back to deep-seated ideas about what it means to be human. How, how do we really think what it means to be, you know, who we are and how we are? Uh, and I feel that, so for me, um, Prasenjit Gora's book was very important, but I felt, why do you not talk about non-humans? He talks about nature, but in the abstract form. And I felt that you can't really think that um, Asia will sort of save us from uh, the Anthropocene because China exterminated its tigers and elephants a thousand years ago. Uh, India never did. And so Asia is a big place where people have had very different um, relationships to uh, various non-humans. So I try to look at, you know, what, what is this universal collective from a subaltern perspective in, in, in uh, you know, today's uh, time of, a, of climate breakdown. So for me, an anthropo a social anthropologist, the way in which uh, non-humans are conceptualized reveals quite a bit about their culture, about their cosmology, about their politics. This is something that um, became important with the work of uh, Philippe Descola, 
who said that people had different ways to think about the non-human. And he sort of comes up with four different ways, naturalism, animism, totemism, and um, analogism. And in these four categories, um, you know, categorizations of uh, the way in which we understand or engage with nature, I find that um, naturalism and animism are the most interesting because in it, he says that naturalism is the Euro-American way of looking at the non-human where we think we control them, okay? There's a binary, they're not part of our world. They have their world, we have our world, they have their laws, we have ours, and there's a distinction between the two. Whereas in animism, he says, and he did his work in um, the Amazon amongst the Achuars, he says that in animism, basically, you don't necessarily think that the jaguar is so different from the human. And you feel that the human can become the jaguar and the jaguar can become human because they share certain um, uh, certain you know, emotions, they say, share the same environment. So there isn't really a clear cut break between the two. And I had just read this book uh, before I went to the Sundarman 20 years ago. And, you know, when I went there, people kept saying, you really should come to the forest. And I said, I'm not a tourist. I'm not a biologist. I don't, you know, I don't care really about uh, trees and tigers. I want to write about your history. And they kept saying, how will you write about us if you don't know our tigers? And so that, that became, as I, as I explained in my book, uh, that became something that for me uh, started to take importance because I realized that um, people kept talking about tigers and talking about them in very strange ways for me. Uh, it wasn't an animal. It was a creature that could shape shift. It was a creature that had compassion. It was a creature that was, that was also cantankerous and very arrogant. So, you know, when you come across a lot of these stories, you start to rethink your idea of uh, what a tiger might mean. And you uh, start looking at that creature from perhaps what um, the, you know, here for me, the Shundarban Islanders had to say. And I found it quite interesting that they'd kind of dislodged my zoo tiger that I had grown up with to reveal a creature that started to, you know, haunt me in my dreams and nightmares. Um, and that sort of took on a new identity. And so this is why I really think that uh, th this is what I got interested by. How do people think, you know, various insects, animals, trees, ghosts, you know, all the whole, the, 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 all of it, we're, it's like a continuum. It's not a binary between two groups. It's really, uh, 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 you know, a long continuum where there are all kinds of creatures and creatures that need to share space, that need to share environments. So how do we, how do we get along to be, you know, to do that? So, um, and, and what Philippe Descola also says, which is very interesting, he says that um, cultures that have been into naturalism, the ones that see a binary, have been cultures that have colonized. Because just as they have seen themselves superior to animals, they have seen themselves superior to other humans, okay? Other humans who didn't live like them, who didn't think like them, they use that difference to inferiorize them and to make them feel not properly human. And so they thought they had the responsibility of bringing in civilization and at the same time, basically subjugating, looting and uh, all the horrors of colonialism that we know of. So, and he says that, so that is what comes when you think of animals in the naturalism sense. And he says, you know, if you think of the cultures that think of animals as in the, in the animism sense, where you can be an animal, the animal can be human. And basically it's not a binary, but it is one where you are on a continuum and you share space and the environment. Then perhaps, um, you are more egalitarian. You don't see yourself in a hierarchy. 
in a top-down uh, understanding to the rest of the world, to not just animals, but other humans, okay? You see yourself as, you know, one where everybody needs to, to, to survive. And I found that interesting. And I, I, you know, so Donna Haraway, also a very important person who at the same time was, was also, you know, so the 1990s for me was very interesting. It was, a, you know, I, I, I started my PhD in 99 and I had come across these authors. And um, so what she said, you know, the, we polish an animal mirror to look for ourselves. And so to a certain extent, uh, you know, this whole idea about dominating big beasts that we see with the British, right? Um, India lost, as you know, most of its wildlife in the 200 years of, of British rule. Um, so basically, um, what I found very interesting in a lot of these representations of animals was how basically animal symbolism is, is used to depict a certain uh, power equation, okay? Where here, the British lion is seen as attacking the Bengal tiger, i.e. the Indian native, okay? And you see Britannia with her two quote unquote pets, uh, you know, Africa, the lion standing in for Africa and the tiger for Asia. Um, again, in the Greco-Turkish War of 1897, you see the caricature of the war knocking and you see Turkey represented as part of Asia as a tiger. Okay? And we know the depictions of uh, of the English, uh, the, the the ways the English depicted the Irish, for example. In a lot of imagery, the Irish are depicted as uh, monkeys and apes. Okay, so basically, the use of the animal symbolism to see the other as as uh, either worthless or to see the other in a certain political context. Um, and I found these, uh, this picture uh, by the British artist uh, Armitage. He uh, drew it in 1858, okay, after the first uh, war of independence in India. And we see sort of Britannia slaying the, um, the tiger, which again stands in for the Indian monarch. And on the other hand, you see how Tipu Sultan, you know, has made this organ showing himself, showing the might of um, the Indian Rajas against uh, the British colonial invader. Okay, so I, I find this, uh, you know, the tiger a very, very interesting imagery to sort of show these power dynamics, okay, and how um, uh, they, they basically they are sending messages uh, to each other through these images. So, you know, when, when uh, Duara says that we, sorry, the, the transition is a little abrupt. Uh, when Duara says that uh, we, um, you know, that we basically uh, have a disenchanted form of nationalism and uh, sort of mindless consumerism, and we need to find a new compass to correct our course, we need to find a post-Western modernity. What does he mean by that? And he says, you know, basically, it's not helpful that we are organized in nation states, uh, because in the face of planetary climate change, we would do better by organizing ourselves into a different kind of collective. And what is this collective? What, what, what does he suggest? And he says that we need to rethink our values, intentions, perhaps most pressingly, our practices. And he says that, you know, with the tsunami and the earthquake, uh, 2004, 2008, the Sichuan earthquake triggered a kind of moral awakening in China, which led to a debate about universal values and what they mean and how they should become a goal for all Chinese. And so Chinese intellectuals turned to resources within the Chinese tradition of universalism or cosmopolitan in the kind and transcendence. And one of the resources to which they turned was uh, this concept of Tianjian, Tianjian, Tianjia, sorry. It's a hierarchical worldview that prioritizes order over freedom, elite governance over democracy. Okay. And this is where I have a slight problem. 
uh, this is my uh, second problem with the book, you know, not just the fact that he did not include any um, any thinking about the non-human, but he also uh, talks about, uh, you know, uh, Tianxia and Vedic Hinduism. And for me, it is problematic because these are uh, ways in which people are not seen as equal, but, you know, ordered very hierarchically with some having more importance than others, okay, men over women, uh, Brahmins over Dalits, etc. So anyway, he says that uh, we should revisit the religious traditions from Asia to examine whether this perhaps allow a more viable foundation for sustainability. And he talks about Ramchandra Guha, who uh, brings in two types of environmental movements, the post-industrial environmentalism of the affluent world and the livelihood environmentalism of the developing world. And so what are the South Asian social and cultural cosmological traditions linked to livelihood environmentalism? We could turn towards to form Duara's suggested transcendental collective. And so I've been, I've been thinking of that, you know, what are the ways in which, uh, what are the ways in which these uh, ancient traditional ways of being have perhaps uh, understood the non-human and can perhaps show us the way towards the future. So, you know, the Jain philosophy of Ahimsa, I, I would say, is really at, at the top. Uh, the first people to not just think about the life of uh, non-human animals, but also the life of non-human plants, right? Uh, to not uproot a, a, a carrot because it will kill it. Uh, says a lot about, you know, this deep engagement uh, this, uh, with, with life and what it means. And, and today we see that, um, you know, the, the, the Jains are some of the biggest exporters, uh, Jains and Hindus are of, uh, of um, the meat business, huh? right? We, we know that a lot of the Gaurakshaks, uh, the, the, it has been about uh, taking the uh, business from uh, Dalits and uh, poor Muslims into uh, sort of another group of people. Um, so here too, if you look at uh, Hinduism, you know, we could say that yes, in Hinduism too, there is a great thinking of the non-human, right? But it is also a system which has uh, to this day uh, really um, continued uh, by looking at people in very unequal ways. And so this is why I sort of contrast this, and I will uh, talk to about it later, with certain other subaltern forms of uh, in, an engagement with the environment where it is not steeped in hierarchy, hmm? where people are a lot more equal. And I like this uh, piece by Radhika Govindarajan um, that came out in the American Ethnologist, um, The Goat That Died for Family. And in it, she looks at and she problematizes the whole animal sacrifice. And she says that, you know, it's not about vegetarianism versus non-vegetarianism, as we know, right? Um, those of us from South Asia, that there is a deeper um, reason, right? It's not really about taking life for a lot of people. It is about not polluting yourself by having, um, you know, the corpse of, a, of an animal inside you, right? So that, that's the bigger belief. Then she says that uh, these people in, um, in, in the central Himalayas who actually practice um, goat sacrifice really think of goats as surrogate children and basically believe that previously they would um, sacrifice children, but now they sacrifice goat instead and that the mountain gods need that. And she says that what is very beautiful is talk of a kind of interspecies kinship. And, uh, and she shows that very beautifully in her book. And I think that what I'm trying to uh, really talk about is the ways in which people have been thinking about the non-human that don't necessarily fit our understanding of, you know, vegetarian, which means that very compassionate and very, you know, protective of the environment versus um, 
meat eaters and uh, people who have. I think that it's more a lot more complicated. As we know, uh, in India anyway, people uh, on uh, you know eat between three to five kilos of meat per year. So it is not, um, and and most of the meat is, you know, from the backyard. Um, so it is animal sacrifice continues to be a major necessary component of worship for many castes. Um, and what is interesting is that, you know, it is a lot more problematic than the way in which people talk about um, the non-human, right, in the context of South Asia. It is, uh, and so what I, what I want to uh, also talk about is that uh, Dwara in a way says that, you know, he excludes uh, Christianity, Islam, Judaism from his understanding of this dialogical transcendence that is present in Asia. But I feel that in South Asia, if you go to so many dargahs in Pakistan or in Bangladesh, you find a lot of water tanks where you find turtles, you find crocodiles, you find certain fish, you find a, a lot of uh, very, very intimate um, relationships, again, with non-humans. So here in Bangladesh, for example, this is a tank where you feed the turtle uh, some food, and you touch its head and that blesses you in a way. Again, uh, when, uh, you know, during the commemoration of Ashura in uh, Muharram, in the, on the 10th day of the month of Muharram, uh, basically you have great veneration. And I'm not saying worship, but I'm saying veneration of the figure of the horse, okay? And the Quran is put on top of the horse to show that basically when you are bowing down, you're not bowing in front of the horse, but to the Quran. But what I mean is that the the kind of creature that is in between, uh, you know, the word of God and humans is this horse, right? So I feel that um, there is all, all across South Asia, very, very particular, uh, deeply thought out relations with non-humans that have always existed. Okay. And, uh, and therefore, you know, uh, we, we, I feel that you can't really say that it's uh, radically different in a way from other forms of living out um, a, a very, very um, deeply understood relationship with uh, the non-human world. Think of jinns also in Islam and the importance they have, right? So there is a blurring of the realms in South Asia of humans, gods, and animals. Uh, as you all know, avatars of the Hindu deity Vishnu, which include humans as, uh, as Lord Rama and Krishna, as well as animals, you know, as a fish, as a turtle, as a wild boar, and also as human-animal hybrid, like uh, Narasimhan. So uh, the Buddhist Jatakas also uh, talk about the earlier lives of the Buddha, where he was a monkey, a parrot, a golden mallard, and even a self-sacrificing hare, right? So, uh, you know, you have this idea that, and I feel, and I really am convinced that the reason why today in India you have so many people who are vegetarian and who really think deeply about the non-human you know, whether they are vegetarian or not, uh, it's not as if people who are not vegetarian in India eat a lot of meat or fish anyway. Um, there is a real thinking um, around, around uh, different species, perhaps something that was less prevalent in a place like China, which has uh, less than 1% vegetarians, and which, as I said, exterminated a lot of its wildlife, not during Mao, a thousand years ago. Um, so, um, you know, it, it is, it is a, a, an interesting uh, use of certain um, subaltern uh, ways of thinking. So, um, Dwara believes that this dialogic transcendence, as I was telling you, as found in the Asian traditions, will lead us out. I am kind of a little uneasy about the fact that we need, uh, you know, an idea of the divine to save us uh, from uh, from our predicament. We need, you know, 
uh, sort of uh, non-worldly moral authority that can speak back to power. And this is why I turn to other subaltern ways of understanding the non-human, like I um, like like I, I told you about in the Shundorbon, where people kept telling me, you know, you need to understand our tigers if you're going to write anything about us. And uh, the kind of complicity they shared with tigers, right? The kind of uh, thinking that went behind um, tigers. So, um, as I told you, you know, this is also, I don't want to go above time. So basically in, in this place, and this is where I want to talk about the idea of the collective that is based on a, an egalitarian understanding of uh, not just humans and non-humans, but also between humans. So in this place, you know, 95% of the people were SC or ST and um, it, the big difference was whether you lived along the river, which was a more dangerous place and where you usually did not own much land because you worked in the forest as a fisher. And, uh, you know, so that was distinguished from those that lived in the center of the island that usually had some land. But as soon as anyone made some money, you know, school teachers, um, people who had uh, go down and were sellers or people who owned a boat, as soon as they had made some money, you know, as soon as the school teachers uh, turned 65, they would basically retire in a suburb of Kolkata and would not stay there. So the whole idea was that, hey, we are all equal here. We are, and, and, and people really, you know, in a way make sure that everybody remains equal. If you, if you are seen as doing too well, your uh, bond will be poisoned and your fruit trees are going to be um, stolen, you know? so. There is this, this ethos that everybody here, we are all in the same godforsaken place. Uh, not just us humans, but also us and our, uh, our, the creatures that live with us. Okay, so in, in this, um, in this uh, worship by Hindus, veneration by Muslims, uh, and as I said, you know, uh, a few days ago to some of my students here, I don't want to talk of Bon Bibi as a goddess necessarily because then it excludes uh, the Muslims who don't see her as a goddess, but as a superpower, as like the, the Christians would say as a saint, you know, who sort of is between Allah and people and who sort of blesses uh, humans and makes their life easier when they go into the forest. And so she's represented as an earthen mound and... Um, she is given some sweets and some flowers. And they say, you know, we show her respect like we do our peers or our parents. We are not venerating her. Uh, we are not worshiping her. We are, we are showing veneration or respect. And so this book um, that was read uh, is a very interesting book called the Bon Bibi Johuranama. And it's not very old. Um, it, it is about basically bringing in some sort of solidarity and brotherhood between humans and tigers that, that she brings. And, um, and as I said, you know, she's, she's very popular in uh, Southern Bengal, both in Bangladesh and in West Bengal. Uh, so, I, you know, I know that this was a big hodgepodge of many uh, ideas and uh, things, but I'm trying here to sort of see if the ways in which we think the non-human, we think more profoundly about the non-human by using certain subaltern practices, certain subaltern understandings, rethinking of, uh, you know, uh, the, the kind of creatures with which we have to uh, share our planet. Does that make us a different kind of people, a kind of people that will perhaps be more mindful about uh, not just, as I said, you know, other creatures, but also other uh, fellow humans. And so this is the kind of collective I'm, I'm kind of uh, wondering if isn't the future, you know, because uh, the collectives uh, proposed by Duara are very hierarchical ones and perhaps ones that are ultimately bound to fail because steeped in hierarchy. Uh, and we have seen what that has done with uh, how Judeo-Christian traditions have seen have seen um, the non-human, right? They have seen them in a hierarchical way. They have seen other humans in a hierarchical way. And therefore, there is a break. Um, so 
I think that um, uh, this is what I was trying to say. I really uh, liked this excerpt from the Gun Island where um, she talks about uh, where, where uh, there is a, a discussion about, um, you know, what, what makes us human, what separates us from animals. And that is the, the faculty of storytelling. And in a way, that's what I felt in the Shundarbon, the fact that people were able to tell me stories, imagine themselves as tigers, right? And, and tell me very, very, um, you know, um, uh, deeply stirring stories about um, the other creatures that they shared their environment with. And so I just thought that um, this is another amazing story uh, from the 10th century perhaps initially from India, it is written where basically the animals are um, very, very disheartened by the fact that some humans have come on their island and have uh, started using them as food, as, um, you know, as, as, uh, as help in the fields and all of that. And so they, they have a lawsuit against humans. And in that lawsuit, very tellingly, they say, that if the humans don't learn to respect us and to, uh, you know, to, 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 yeah, to respect us and to be compassionate towards us, it will be their end. And this was in the 10th century. Okay, so it was penned in Arabic by the members of the Islamic Brethren of Purity, mm -hmm. Ikwan al Safa, a Sufi order in Iraq in the 10th century. And uh, so I, you know, this, this last uh, line. So, he says that humans must begin to treat all creatures with loving kindness. And that's what the, the king who sat on, on this verdict. And he says, the animals will begin to disappear one by one forever from the face of the earth and the air in your settlements and fortresses will become dangerous to breathe. The seasons will be reversed and your climates turned on end. The animals you eat will bring sickness and death upon you and you will no longer rule the earth. Okay, so... I, I find it incredible that this was all those many years ago. And this is an artist who really makes me um, think very deeply about certain things. And he has been exploring again uh, the tiger in the Southeast Asian context and uh, uses the image of the tiger in stories, Southeast Asian uh, myths to explore, for example, Singapore's environmental past. And I feel that increasingly, you know, this is what can um, can um, allow us to to rethink a different future. It's the power of stories, the power of rethinking uh, human relations uh, with other humans, with non-humans. And uh, with this, I end my talk today. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Professor Jale. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you, Professor Mathe. So, so as I was listening to you, I had uh, two kinds of parallel thoughts going on in my head, right? Uh, one was basically trying to understand the argument and, <laughs> and kind of having got a sense of the gist of it, I was constantly trying to think of how one would use this argument, right? Apply it mm -hmm. in some sense. So there is a, a you know, what is this... Um, uh, you know, this transcendence idea, this, this notion of solidarity, reclaiming this notion of solidarity. And, and then the parallel track was how? Uh, given that, uh, given the second question specifically, because there are so many things that militate against it today, right? And, mm -hmm. and also, and this is, this is probably my first question in, in the sense, uh, clearly these kinds of solidarities did exist and continue to exist in some form so forth, right? And the, the one of the questions that, that comes to mind is um, what happened? I guess we know what happened, uh, how it happened, but why, I suppose, did, uh, did they kind of recede into the margins of the subaltern, I suppose, right? Um, and, and so that's, I guess, I guess I'm just struggling with how you would take this idea because, um, I mean, I mean, the, the quote that you shared from the 10th century, the, the book in Arabic is mm. very profound, you know, and mm. you could kind of uh, use the last paragraph to summarize what's going on today, you know. Mm. Um, 
but so clearly there's something going on here it's 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 not that um, and many people have tried to speak about this, uh, especially anthropologists. The other book that I was remembering when I listened to you was The Way of the Human Being by an anthropologist called uh, from Calvin Luther Martin, I think. Um, mm -hmm. He was writing about the uh, Native Americans. I'm sorry, the, um, the, um, the Eskimos mm -hmm. uh, uh, in Canada. And, but similarly, roughly making kind of a similar argument about the, this lack of dualism between the animal i mean the reference in the book was the animal people and us you know the human mm. people and the animal people and 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 eating an animal was considered a relationship you don't kill a, you're actually mm. requesting the bear to provide you nourishment and it's a very sophisticated kind of way of thinking about these things um so this this idea exists right um and the, the question is um you know uh a maybe you know why did it kind of move away what are the processes, I suppose, that rendered it um, in the margins, right? And, yeah. you know. Thank you. This is a very good question. Uh, so can I, can I respond? Yeah. Please do, please do, yeah. And we're waiting for questions to come. So, so partly this is why, you know, I got interested in uh, what Amitav Ghosh says in The Great Derangement and how basically we have lost this faculty to be surprised uh, by the uncanny, by the strange. And I think that that has to do with us being able in the 19th century to certain, to, to control things. And with, with, you know, a greater control of our environment, Suddenly, what existed out of it? Anything that did not fit in this idea that basically we are the new gods, right? Humans are the new gods. That you know, we don't need God. We don't need um, we don't need the fearful. We don't need anything that uh, we do not understand. Right. Because that just complicates things. So we we prefer being the ones that control everything which is why you know it this subaltern way of thinking uh, this marginal way of thinking as, as you have put it still exists only in places where in a way quote unquote modernity hasn't really reached you know uh, so um, in in uh, certain tribes in the Amazon, and which is also why I was very surprised to see um, that in the Shundarbon people were so um, convinced, you know, about the fact that uh, they shared this relationship with tigers. Because I came from a place where you know a lot of things could be controlled, and I realized that. They came. They existed in a place where very little could be controlled. You know, whether it's um, the climate and how it's going to affect uh, them. You know, with cyclones uh, hitting really uh, strong. You know, you know some of the strongest cyclones, right, in the Indian Ocean and hitting, uh, as we know, uh, southern Bengal, whether it's Bangladesh or West Bengal. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, twice a year in the months of April, May, and again in October, November, you have these 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 two times when um, the um, kind of islands on which the uh, people live in the Shundarbon, which are like basins because they have mud walls around them, uh, risk suddenly getting submerged by salt water because the wind and uh, the the high tides may just uh, wash away or, uh, you know, sort of um, make breaches in the embankments that protect the island. And once that happens, you lose your source of fresh water because your pond, pond is contaminated with salt water, all your fish die, uh, your house uh, may just get uh, blown, uh, you know, blown away by the high strong winds. Right, right. Um, so basically in this place where, you know, you, you I felt, Okay, you, you still, you still need God. You still need, or I, I don't know if one should say God, but you still are, you still feel very, very, um, very much like a helpless human, right? At the mercy mm -hmm. of winds, at the mercy of tigers, at the mercy of, of, of other humans, you know. Um, 
And so this is why I feel you still can have a return uh, or, or a, a, an understanding of the non-human where, um, you know, where, where you don't see yourself as superior. To what right. extent is that possible in a society where everything can be controlled? I don't know. But that's an illusion. What, what, what Amitav Ghosh is saying is that today we feel, we see that we can't control the climate anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So are we going to go back to, you know, uh, a certain... But for me, it's about a certain respect, you know, right. Of, right. of that world. It is not uh, to be completely incapacitated and sort of being superstitious, but it is about, uh, you know, a certain reckoning, a certain um, realization that, uh, you know, we, we can't control everything. We are not gods. And if we want to continue living on this planet, we have to make our peace with, uh, you know, uh, non-humans right look at covid right, 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 <laughs> it's, right. it's uh, so and 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 uh, scientists are predicting that we are going to get a lot more of these so you know uh, to what extent uh, well, i think he's he's very much right and and now we realize that um, we we are back we know if we reached a certain climax right of us being able to control everything now we feel that uh, actually we can't so, so the uh, so Elon Musk will say that we can move away from <laughs> from from this planet. Yeah, let uh, him do it. Uh, <laughs> I believe him once he's done it. It's not their argument, but there are people who believe in that kind of stuff. Yeah, right? they're good for and, them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Yeah, I, you know. <laughs> yeah. So the. Uh, Again, I guess the, the the thing I'm coming back to maybe maybe at a slightly different angle here then, right? Um, I guess there is reference to South Asian cultures and South Asia, right? And and I think you started off with this kind of uh, juxtaposing the the East and the West, roughly speaking, right? Uh, um, but but the, the 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 kind of the Western game is now the universal game, right? So you, the the competition for global power, prominence, prestige, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, uh, so yes, there are these uh, cultural possibilities that may exist, uh, spiritual possibilities that may exist, etc. But um, the 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 politics is certainly arranged in 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 the divergent direction, right? So it is a superpower, whatever regional power, superpower, whatever power, at some point, right? Uh, how how does that? No, I mean, I guess the question: How do how do say i mean you know um how how does that negotiation actually happen you know going forward do you even it does for example I, you mentioned the nation state and that being a problematic category does renouncing the nation state or does renouncing power in those ways uh, or is doing those things essential i mean so I, in some sense i'm asking is Forgoing power, conscious foregoing of power at the individual level in the kind of Gandhian Swaraj kind of way, right? You control you, you yourself rather than seek more, uh, or and at the national level, the collective level, right? Is that an essential part of this? Because um, that would seem to be the reality of the people living in the Sundarbans, whether by design or by uh, you know uh, default, that's their reality. So the question is, can you do it by design, right? <laughs> I don't know if it can be done by design, but uh, really, you know, and the thing is, I know that uh, the nation state is perhaps what we have best, you know, what, what is, what else do we organize ourselves around? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, it's not as if I have <laughs> any answer to this, but... Um, Gandhi started think, with village republics. Uh, yeah, say. yeah, but I think more humility, you know, in general. Uh -huh. Uh, and 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 you know, uh, for whatever his faults, uh, it, the Kantian philosophy of depending on yourself here, yeah, <laughs> you know, would be um, uh, would be important, but not one where again, not one which is hierarchical, which he believed right. in, but one which is. Uh, you know, a, a lot more egalitarian. I really mm. feel that hierarchy is what leads us to animosity and, and a certain, you know, break. 
it really is all about trying to live uh, equitably uh, and equally, right? Because it is with the very uh, idea that you are superior or better than others. You have that idea that you can take more than others. Whereas having the humility of feeling that, no, you, you, you are just like anybody else. You don't have more, um, you know, um, um, yeah, you, 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 you can't be using more resources than anybody else. I think mm -hmm. that that is when you start being uh, a lot more mindful about uh, the environment and about others. And I think this is why, uh, the, you know, uh, the Northern nations should really uh, pay reparations. I, I feel that, um, as you know, climate change is, is deeply... The, res the, the results of it is deeply unequal and that therefore um, um, at some point, you know, why should people taking flights not pay a lot more for them? Um, why, should, why should basically the lifestyle of a few be at the detriment of the many? Okay? And, uh, and I think, yeah, yeah the Sundarman people never, you know, never heard a fly in a way. They've never contributed to any, um, you know, uh, carbon emissions. And yet they're the, the first to face, uh, uh, you know, what is happening today. So, right. but as I said, I think that this can only be accompanied with a greater belief in social equity. You know, land redistribution, mm -hmm. uh, really education, medical health, everything, you know, where you are not going to think along caste lines or majority, right. minority and all of that, but really right. one where every citizen is given what is uh, what is due. And this is possible in some countries. So, you know, uh, really a rethinking of this. Uh, why, why can't okay. it be possible? Okay, okay. I just noticed that there were some questions coming up in the chat box. I, I, was, Good. I was looking at the wrong, wrong box. Uh, let me just start. Um, shall I? Yeah, that's on the screen there. Can you read it? Uh, Lab-grown meat is due to become widely available in this decade. Uh, you know. I uh, get it. I've been I've been thinking of uh, that a lot. I don't think it is a very sustainable. Um, if it if it is, and if it if it to produce uh, one kilo of lab grown meat, if it is uh, something that is going to be environmentally sustainable, more sustainable than you know uh, having uh, animals with farms. Uh, then why not? But from what I've read on the issue, it is still very, very expensive, and it is still something that um, that you know will is 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 not going to happen in this decade. Um, the thing that perhaps um, I feel could um, thanks. Uh, uh, the, what I feel uh, should. Uh, be the way forward is more mindfulness, really. You know, the, the, the Buddhist ethic of the middle path where, um, it, you know, as I said, for me, it's not about necessarily being vegetarian or not. That is one part of it, of course. But it is also, you know, so, so the, the vegetarian who uh, flies, uh, you know, three times a year uh, versus uh, the person in the Shundarbon who is fishing and eating meat once a week or once a month and never flies, you know, uh, it's easy to see who uh, is having a more harmful impact on the environment, right? So it is about uh, the amount uh, that one consumes and, um, you know, uh, and about a whole lot of other lifestyle choices. But yeah, I, I, I certainly um, feel that it is important to, to be reducing and to be thinking about these things. And hopefully, yeah, lab-grown meat will be uh, something we can all enjoy. But I just hope it will not cost us more. It won't be a greater carbon footprint than, uh, you know, uh, having a goat and, or a chicken in your backyard and, and, and slaughtering it for food. So let's see.
Okay. Hi, Varuni. I had a question. Hi, Manus. You mentioned that cultures that see the animal world through the lens of naturalism, yes, tend to colonize. That's what that's what Philip Descola says. While those that are informed by animism are less likely to try and control the natural world and control other people because they do not view, view the world in binaries and in a hierarchical way. Yes, uh, where uh, sort of culture is superior to nature, and these are people who have also never colonized others. So it's, it's very interesting to think of that. People who have always had a very um, complicitous relationship with the non-human, uh, in a way, are people who have cohabited with others without trying to exterminate them. Yeah? Versus naturalism, where we have zoos, but on the other hand, we have uh, chopped down all the forests and uh, you know killed off all the wild animals. So yeah, that's what that's what he says. I'm curious how this relates to the commonsensical understanding that non-Western religious traditions are more compassion. See, this is where I also have a a problem, and this is why I brought in this whole thing. I I don't necessarily think that they are more compassionate. I feel that within um, I think that to a certain extent, yes, but I think that is not all. And for me, vegetarianism, if it is not delinked to an idea of hierarchy, it does not mean anything. Because if you're going to be a vegetarian, but believe that you are superior by being it, then it doesn't work, right? So this is why, in a way, I feel that you know, when, when Dwara says that, oh, these ancient Hindu traditions and all of us, that I, I don't I don't believe so. And this is why I, I often I tell my students, you know, how is it then that the Jains are today controlling the meat market in India? Themselves are vegetarian, but have no problem, you know, uh, slaughtering uh, animals and uh, basically exporting them. So, again, what is, and for me, this is why, you know, a, an idea of social justice and social equity is important because you are vegetarian for various reasons, right? To save the world, to you know, make it a better place for animals for compassionate reasons, but it can also be because you are this pure person who does not want to be contaminated by dirty meat, right? And so um, this, is, this is where I, I see uh, um, you know, in a way, those who eat meat in India, and like people in the Shundarbund, when they can afford it, which is, you know, very rarely, um, are a lot more, are a lot more compassionate towards animals. And if they take the animal flesh in them, it's because they believe that they are animal too. You know, they can become the tiger's flesh, right? The food, the tiger's food. And, and similarly, they're going to eat the chicken and one day they might be eaten by the tiger, right? It's a chain where, you know, it's not, it's not because you are eating chicken that you are somehow polluted or inferior, okay? Or superior. No, it's just a, a, a system where you eat, get eaten. It's, you know, part of this whole thing, right? So... It's it's this is this is this is partly why I sort of bring in the whole Sundarman thing because I feel that it complicates and I, I this is why also I like Radhika Govindarajan's piece the goat that died for family because it complicates uh, animal sacrifice and why people do it right how, how many people you know who are vegetarians around you have a very uh, loving relationship to uh, goats even dogs huh? Um, do you think it's possible to think of the Anthropocene as bringing back to theory the grandness deconstructed by postmodern thinking, if not in any other way, in that we do face a common crisis and of crisis? This is a very, very uh, good question. Assuming that those... <laughs> I think so. Uh, can I see the... Uh, first part of the question again. It's possible to think of the Antrimonial bringing back to theory the grandness. <sighs> Maybe, I think that 
the, you know, thinking about the Anthropocene in a way deconstructs a lot of things, right? As I was saying, it does not only deconstruct our sense of being in control, because we are not anymore. Um, and, uh, and so, yes, why not? You know, I feel that it is also forcing us to rethink certain certitudes, certain ways of, of, of always, um, you know, um, of, of, of being convinced about uh, lifestyle. Uh, yes. Can you say something about Dokkin Rai, uh, the deity of the show? So Dokkin Rai is one deity in certain parts. Um, it is also this shape-shifting Brahmin uh, sage that one day decided to take the form of a tiger uh, to eat humans, okay? And it's interesting because this story is the story in the in the Bone Bibi text, which is only about 200 years old. The older story uh, by Krishna Ram Das uh, in the 17th century is about Dokkin Rai and Peer Baba Gaji Shaheb being friends, okay? And uh, the two having at, at that point some, some kind of war and then understanding. And then in the story, Dokkin Rai actually... So is this shape-shifting uh, Brahmin sage who uh, wants to become a, a man-eater and takes the form of a tiger for that and starts killing more and more people. Allah in his compassion decides uh, to send Bone Bibi. And, you know, uh, so and then there's the story of Dukhe. Um, and Dukhe uh, is told by his mother to call Bone Bibi if he faces any uh, trouble in the forest. And as though Kinrai comes to kill him, he calls out to Ma Bone Bibi and she sends her brother, Shah Jongoli, to basically catch the Kinrai. And where does the Kinrai go? He runs off to his friend, Peer Baba Gaji Shahib. And then the peer brings him to, the, to Bone Bibi and the peer tells him on the way, listen, you know, you better call her mother because uh, you can't go on like this. And he says he is sorry. He says, uh, you know, adopt me as your son. And she says, I have also adopted this human child as my son. So you are therefore brothers. And from this day on, um, humans can only enter the forest um, pure hearted and empty handed, which means with no firearms or with no sort of devious motives, and with no greed. And tigers, cannot kill humans if they come in that way. So people often said, you know, if you go to the forest having nothing left at home, you'll be safe. The tiger won't attack you. And even last, uh, not last year, but the year before, when I was in the Shundarbon, somebody I knew had just been killed and it was terrible. People kept telling me, you know, Orjun had got an NGO job. Why did he need to go to the forest? It was just greed. He wanted to make more money. He shouldn't have. And so they rationalized each and every killing of people in the forest with the fact that that person had been greedy. I found, I found that incredible that, you know, 20 years later, you're going there and people are telling you the same thing. Uh, this real conviction that the forest is the space of equality, is the space where Ma Bon Bibi looks out for the poor people, for those who don't have anything. If you have land, if you have another way of making money, you do not go to the forest. You cannot because you won't be safe. And uh, so it, 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 it's very interesting. Uh, you know, again, a, a, a story that sort of indirectly tells us a lot, right? About, uh, about you know, what to take, how to take, how much to take uh, from, from the forest. So Shumit, uh, have I said enough? Have I uh, responded enough on Dokkin Rai? So Dokkin Rai is actually also, uh, you know, put in the shrines uh, to Ma Bon Bibi. But if in Salt Lake, I've seen some shrines to Dokkin Rai and usually it's just a head. Uh, in the Shundurban areas, uh, which are the most southern, he is, um, you know, he is also... Um, uh, sort of evocated in the prayers, you know, he's also sort of honored, but he is not uh, really worshipped. It's Mabon Bibi who is worshipped. So people end the, 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 they call it the Hajot 
to Ma Bon Bibi with um, uh, Ma Bon Bibi Name Lai Lalla Molo. You know, so in the name of Bon Bibi says there is no God but God, and then they say Dokhin Rai Name Hori Bol Molo. So in the name, and 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 people say these two things one after the other. Uh, how do you see it at loggerheads? Uh, <laughs> I have no answer. I really don't know. But how, how do you see necessarily as uh, at loggerheads with wildlife conservation and social justice? Because, yes, I see, okay, compassion shown to animals when, for me, yeah, it does not make sense to sort of, you know, if you think of all the places where today you still have wild animals, you're going to see that you still have humans there, okay? And humans who've not asked anything of anybody who are living their lives and, you know, um, so it is, it is uh, very sad to see that, yes, uh, very often, you know, in the name of compassion for animals, you sort of have a safari park that comes up where the very people who lived in sort of symbiosis with uh, the animals of that park are now going to be seen as petty poachers and kicked out and will lose any kind of livelihood and, um, uh, and you will have, you know, uh, middle class tourists who can go in there and sort of photograph animals. But I feel that really, if, uh, and that is really beautiful that a lot of kids today in India, in the middle classes are thinking very, uh, you know, that there are so many magazines and um, stories about animals and about our kindness towards animals. And I feel that there should be stories from people who live uh, you know, who have lived in symbiosis with animals. There should be stories from them, okay? Uh, because it, it makes sense to see how people, you know, how people who have been living with these creatures actually talk about these creatures, right? Uh, and I think that it, as you, as you, as you say it, um, you know, uh, we, we can't really have, uh, we, you know, we can't really have biotic equity without thinking of other non-humans. And this is also at a planetary scale, right? You know, it does not make sense for Americans to be talking about, you know, protecting uh, certain areas of theirs without thinking of uh, the, the lifestyles they're having and the repercussions that is having on people in, in India or Bangladesh, right? So I feel that it is at every level that one should really be rethinking a lot of our choices. Um, considering most communities such in the present world don't live completely as a larger world. How do I respond to hierarchical systems? This is exactly imposed, but this is a very, very good question. Um, you know, very often they try to emulate these um, because they think that that's the better way of being. So in the Shundorbon, for example, um, a lot of boys, you know, now that they have got educated, have started treating their mothers or sisters or wives as uh, lesser people. Uh, because they see that that is what happens in Kolkata, you know, and uh, so they, they, there is a real new hierarchical uh, kind of relationship that has come in, uh, which I find very disturbing, um, because they kind of see that as being, you know, proper Hindus. So if previously, when I was there 20 years back, I saw many marriages between Adivasis and, you know, lower caste Hindus of different uh, groups. Um, a lot of even, uh, not a lot, but some marriages between Hindus and, and Muslims. Uh, today, of course, these have become very problematic because, um, you know, people have been talking against Bon Bibi and saying, oh, she, you know, she's an Islamic goddess. You shouldn't be worshipping her. And stuff like that. So it it you know there is a 
there is a refusal to be egalitarian because that is not how they are uh, treated, right? When they go to the city. And so they reproduce the kind of discrimination they uh, face in, in their families, in their communities. No. We're just uh, waiting for a question. But there was a question from a uh, uh, from Joyita Banerjee. Uh, Did I miss wanted... it? No. The problem is uh, she would. She wants to. I mean, unfortunately, the platform doesn't let her speak. She has to type it out. Um, okay. And uh, so she wants to share, propose a model for addressing climate change through education. Would you please hear me out? Uh, but I would have loved to allow her to propose the model here. But uh, the the technology here doesn't allow me to, uh, you know, the audience can't actually speak their question. Um, so she's a bit of a problem. Uh, Joyita, I mean, I'm not sure if you're still there. And if you can maybe type out a brief outline of the model, um, if that's possible at all, please do so. Um, if not, uh, my apologies. Um, it's just the, the limitation of the, of the, the system here. Okay. So I know while while we're waiting, I just um, the I, I was trying to get to the politics of this, right? And your your last comment kind of triggered it, or kind of reminded me of this. You said uh, Bon Bibi is a Muslim goddess, and you can't. Uh, and uh, uh, B says thank you uh, in the chat box. Uh, but, but the point was that we are in a politically very fraught time, not just everywhere, right? And you're, you're trying to bring up conversations that kind of do not subscribe to these opportunistic kind of convenient political labels, right? So, um, I mean, <laughs> I'm just sounding pessimistic here, I suppose, but um, where do you see um, how, you know, how do we find hope here? Let me put it that way, rather than saying there's no hope. Um, uh, what are the roots, you know, what directions do we look at for finding hope? I find it very difficult to find hope. And yet, you know, we need, we need to find hope wherever we can. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 I am, yeah, quite pessimistic on the future in both uh, West Bengal and Bangladesh. And you're right, you know, uh, I feel in a way, Bengal, was, which has been at the margins of both Islam and Hinduism, you know, with a, with a, with a uh, thriving Hinduism of its own, with a thriving uh, Islam of its own, is suddenly being challenged uh, by more, uh, you know, Orthodox Hindus as well as Orthodox Muslims as being not proper. And uh, instead of having the confidence and saying, you know, um, this is how we are, this is who we are. And uh, we, we have managed to cohabit and to, you know, uh, live more or less peacefully together. Um, uh, today, you unfortunately have, you know, on both sides, um, a, and this is really led by the middle classes, a, an urge to 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 join kind of mainstream Islam and mainstream Hinduism, and uh, in a way that loses out the flavor of what was very distinctly Bengali um, in in both uh, these religious practices. And for me, that is a, a, a great shame, right? Uh, losing mm -hmm. out on diversity, losing out on all these little. Um, practices, you know, on like, like, uh, for example, the veneration of uh, Bon Bibi or the Baul songs or <clears throat> all kinds of, um, you know, practices at the Mazars, uh, which are visited by both Hindus and Muslims uh, and Christians. I grew up, uh, I, I, we often went to the island of Bashunti, uh, which is one of the islands of the Shundurbon. And there, I remember seeing Bon Bibi as a, as a child, but I also remember uh, attending all night Jishu Kirtan, 
so you had kirtans sung in 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 honor of jesus and um these were by groups of hindu muslim christians all together you know singing and dancing and there was a, a, a you know a, a priest today there are about 30 groups who who sing and you know uh, sort of but these are very uh, you know these are very bengali things that um, exist uh, you know from the 17th century uh, when the portuguese came and so so basically uh, i feel i feel uh, quite sad to see that there is a a kind of very you know one would say wahhabi islam and brahminical hinduism that is getting forced on a people that have done things their own way and um you know have have been fine so people in the shundarbon today have this inferiority complex you know we shouldn't be worshiping uh 20 years ago they told me we shouldn't be worshiping mahabun we should we should worship mahali and uh, now they're saying you know we should do ram lila it is something that was completely unheard of uh, 20 years ago <laughs> so you know it's 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 interesting and the same is happening in in bangladesh where uh, i was interested in uh, the mazar practices so i went to a lot of urs and um, you know where the all night uh, kawali singing of uh, the saints life usually commemorating uh, a saint a sufi peers um, birth or death and uh, so I got interested in the Urs because a lot of people in Dhaka and in the big cities told me oh you know you shouldn't do that that's like that's that's wrong that that those people are so ignorant they don't know what proper Islam is and um, and so I got interested in you know wh why do those wh why do those people say what they say about um, and what they said was very interesting for me they said you know we are commemorating the saint that brought us Islam, that allowed us to be seen as humans. Uh, you know, we were never treated as equals within Hinduism. And this allowed us to, 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 to be part of a fold of a community where, you know, we're supposed to, not that caste doesn't exist. Huh? It exists, uh, we know, in Christianity, in, in Islam, in South Asia, it, 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 even in Sikhism, which was, uh, you know, uh, all about uh, all against caste right so they they kept saying that for us it's a question of veneration it's a question of venerating the man who brought us islam the way we venerate our parents the way we show respect to our parents or our teachers we show respect to the saint and who are these wahhabis to tell us that we are not proper muslim because we uh, venerate the saint that brought us islam so i found that very interesting you know and 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 so this is similar to what is happening in Bengal today, where people are being told that during Durga Puja, if you're feasting and eating meat, you're not proper Hindus. What is this? We will stop that. And, and in Bengal, 99% of the population is, um, you know, fish and meat eating, even Brahmins. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 uh, there has never been a distinction along. Like everybody has eaten goat and fish, okay? Not chicken, not other meat, but at least... Um, you know, the fruit of the ocean and the animal you sacrifice to Makali was eaten by all castes. So mm -hmm. today, again, you know, so there is, and, and the only people who did not, unfortunately, you know, who, who basically were, uh, were ostracized uh, and, 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 and stopped from eating fish or, or meat were widows. So Bengalis have said, you know, why would we, when we are celebrating the return of our daughter, to our homes, you know, Durga is coming back with her children. That's that's the idea. We are all feasting. We are all celebrating. She's not a widow, so why will we serve? You know, why will mm -hmm. eat, we eat vegetarian food at, at that time? So it's a different understanding, right, of of this whole festival, which uh, suddenly is is creating a lot of uh, problem for our North Indian um, neighbors. There's a question that's just come in, uh, Anu. Uh, Where says, do you think uh, the desire to join mainstream Hinduism or Islam comes from? Is it a desire to, uh, uh, for acceptance or an idea of superiority of the mainstream cultures or something? I think, you know, it's a bit perhaps a desire of acceptance, for acceptance, a desire uh, also perhaps, I feel, a, a, a an inferiority complex. Um, 
and suddenly you feel, you know, the way the West Pakistanis ruled over these Pakistanis, right, for 25 years before they gained independence, perhaps, you know, left, and they were always constantly told they were not proper Muslims because they didn't speak Urdu, because they ate fish and not meat, because they listened to Tagore songs, uh, because they had a whole lot of practices within their marriages where you put... Um, Hulud, you know, Haldi on the face. And, and these are, you know, this is uh, whatever your religion, everybody does it in Bengal. So basically the West Pakistanis were suddenly saying, you know, this is all wrong. You shouldn't be, you, this, is, this is not being proper Muslim, right? So I think that there is this urge to um, be seen as, um, you know, uh, like better, I, 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 I frankly think that that is part of it. Yes, perhaps, I don't know. At least I know that in, um, uh, not in Calcutta so much, but on the outskirts and in slums, you know, there is this thing of, well, you know, let's let's be better Hindus. We should perhaps stop to go to the Mazar. We should stop worshiping Bon Bibi or Ola Bibi or, uh, you know, do the, Chundi part and instead do something uh, more. So I, I, there is really, uh, yeah, the 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 power of um, you know what is seen as the modern and the new and the 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 better, right? And it's very difficult to fight uh, the might of money uh, that you know certain parties seem to be having today. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I'm 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 actually very despondent. Uh, I you know I try to remain hopeful by turning. I feel more and more towards literature and art, but um, yeah. I, right, right. Hmm. Sorry, I think yeah, yeah. it's uh, it's uh, we've we've come to the end of our conversation, right? Yeah, I was just giving mm -hmm. a minute or two to see if there are any uh, last you know parting questions from the floor, if. Uh, if anybody wanted to yeah please feel free to email me yeah i think your address was on the was it on the flyer Anna? yes or on the first slide i think it was okay you just okay. google me and you should okay. find yeah. my work yeah. address yeah great okay so uh okay thank you so much think, yeah but no let me officially and formally thank you uh for accepting the invitation and then and, and taking us on a pretty what shall i say interesting ride Okay, <laughs> and, and you know, kind of uh, up, you know, uh, kind of removing this easy comfort with modernization, modernity, and problematizing some of these very difficult conversations that we have to have. And and I think uh, hopefully the 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 this it won't end in despondency, but rather would inspire people to figure out ways in which we could perhaps have these conversations. I think. Uh, and and then, like you said, you know, write story, write new stories, because mm. that's what we are as humans ultimately. So, uh, okay, there's one question that just came in. So that was, I mean, I hope you know that it's an inspiring uh, point. There's this. Uh, Hi, Joita. This is such a good point. I agree with you completely. Very, very true. You know, Joita, um, uh, a small story. From the Shundorbon, uh, I initially uh, worked in the local school as an English teacher, teacher in English, <laughs> because the the local teacher had gone off um, on some. Uh, basically, he wasn't there, so they, the headmaster said, "You know, you you're staying in our village. Can you?" Can you take the classes? You know, uh, and so I said, fine. I'm, I'm, uh, you know. And every afternoon, I, I went and gave some um, uh, classes to um, those who were in class seven and class nine. And so I would talk with the other school teachers. And one day, the headmaster told me, you know, these people are so ignorant that they don't even know Hindu names from Muslim names. So last year we had a Ghazi, and uh, so he was smart. If they're not smart, we don't care because they leave school by class seven or eight. But if we see that they have the potential to uh, give their mathumik, we give them a proper Hindu name because it doesn't look good. And so, you know, names like Johura, like, um, like Ghazi, we're all being uh, properly Hinduized. Yeah. 
and i had i came across many names alibor and uh, you know so all kinds of all kinds of uh, names uh, that were um, you know uh, from the other denomination and i found that quite incredible right and so yeah here too education at that level is trying to categorize people and force them into being good hindus or good muslims right Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, Anu. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks to the audience uh, who joined in with. Uh, yeah. Thank you for joining us, <laughs> and thanks to the audience for your questions. Yeah. And uh, um, I think uh, 